There we go. That way we'll have the right numbers to go with everything. So good news, if you know what a logit is and you know what a probit is, you know how to do this. And yes, too legit to quit has been my joke, quantitude people, for at least 10 years. But if you're not sure what the joke is, here's a YouTube video where you can educate yourself. This is based on an MC Hammer song from the 90s, which is too legit to quit, and I have hijacked that into too legit to quit. It has a hand gesture that goes with it, too. You're, some of us remember too legit to quit. Hey, hey. Yeah, that's, that is what it says. Hey, hey. Yeah, that's, that's the background vocals. Anyway. So here are the main choices for what is now called polytomous data. So categorical data is what the rest of the world calls it. In the context of psychometric models, these types of responses are polytomous as the answer. And there's three kinds. Either they're definitely ordered, which I would call ordinal. So most of your data are going to fall into this category, like strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree. How often do you do this? Never, rarely, sometimes, a lot, like any of those scales where you're reasonably certain about the ordering of the responses. That's going to become a link function known as cumulative. Logits or probits, but cumulative is the key word may be ordered, so the idea that at least some of them are ordered, but you're not sure. So like if you have an item where like you could understand none of it, you could understand one part, you could understand the other part, or you could understand both parts, like that kind of idea. That's what's known as partial credit in this world, and it's also known as adjacent category is the link function that we'll use. And then the last one is not ordered, so nominal. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? There's only one incorrect answer, of course, it's mint chip, but there could be lots of correct, I know, see this is reasonable people would disagree, but there's lots of correct answers as to what your favorite ice cream flavor could be, or what the best kind of pet is, or if someone is mean to you, which of the following things are you most likely to do? Like those kinds of questions, what I would call nominal, they're called nominal responses in this framework as well. And the link function that we'll use is baseline category. So the way that these models differ from each other is entirely on how they take a set of item responses and divide them up into multiple binary items. They divide them up differently. And the result is one of these three families. So the first one the one that you probably have already seen in a different context is for ordinal responses. So this one has names that go by cumulative logit or probit for the link function. In regression modeling, this is a proportional odds model. So if you've seen that before, or ordinal regression, that's what this is for. In IRT, it's called a graded response model. And it would still be called CFA for categorical outcomes if you're using IFA software like M plus to estimate it. So here's an example of what this would look like. Let's say that I have an ordinal item with four choices, starting at zero. The cumulative link function is going to do the following. It's going to create three binary, what I call, submodels. That's my word for it. I don't know that that's a word that I invented, but it's a word that I use. But the way that it works then is it will say, what is the probability of answering zero versus something higher than zero? So that's one new binary outcome. Then what's the probability of answering zero or one versus two or three as a second binary outcome? And then what's the probability of zero, one, two versus three as the third? And I have three submodels because I have four responses. What if I had five responses? How many submodels would I have? I'd have four, because then I'd have one more that would be 0, 1, 2, 3 versus 4. So the number of submodels is always minus 1 relative to the number of answer choices. That's why in binary, there was only one that we had to worry about, because there's only two answers, so there's only one model. Now here's the tricky part. 
different packages in software are either going to predict the red part or the blue part. If it predicts the red part, then we're talking about thresholds. If it predicts the blue part, we're talking about intercepts. So essentially what these submodels are doing is labeling the lower choice as the zero of the binary item. I'm doing air quotes here, YouTube people. The zero and the higher choice is the one. So the only thing that is tricky about this is keeping track of what the model is predicting as the one based on which submodel you're in. So here is what an empty model would look like. So just a fixed intercept, no thetas, no predictors, no nothing yet. We would have a separate intercept estimated for each submodel that would tell us what is the probability of the higher outcome in logits. So here's what it is if you write it in probability here directly, e to the probability or e to the model over 1 plus e to the model. Then we have what is the probability of 2 or 3, and then what is the probability of 3. The intercepts and or thresholds and or difficulties are all going to be different across the submodels, but the slopes are going to be the same, just like it is in proportional odds. So then to get how the model predicts the middle categories, we have to subtract between predictions. So if we look at, say, the first two here on slide four, I've got one model that tells me the probability of zero versus something else. The other one tells me zero and one versus something else. If I want to know, well, what's the probability of one? I start with, okay, well, the second model is give, giving me zero and one together. If I then subtract from it the probability of just the zero part, then I get the one. So these are called indirect models sometimes because to get the middle categories, you have to, to go between them. But it, you do eventually get the prediction of what is the probability of each possible response just building across these submodels to do it. And it looks like that. Right. So I know uh, I had several of you in my generalized class. Those of you who weren't in that class, is this sounding familiar? Have you seen this before? Proportional odds? A little bit, maybe? This is one of those moments where I did not understand this at all when I learned it in IRT. And then like three years later when I was a postdoc, I, I thought I did a class on that had logistic regression and these models as one of it. And I was like, oh my God, that's what this was. Yes, it is. This is not different than just a regular regression model. The only catch is that theta is latent instead of observed. But this is exactly how I would predict using regression. Any one of these answers by themselves is carving up the choices into binary submodels and then estimating a binary model concurrently at the same time that has different intercepts or thresholds but shares a slope across the three. So this approach enforces an ordering. Each of these um, probabilities has to correspond to more theta. Like there's no way these could go backwards in terms of their ordering of the thresholds or the, diff or the intercepts. So this enforces order and thus this would only be used if you can reasonably defend the fact that your categories are ordered. They use, in terms of its probability distribution, not normal, not Bernoulli, but a term called multinomial. Multinomial is a generalization of Bernoulli for more than two categories. And basically, it's the probability of that answer, the one that you have. So this is another instance in which we don't have to worry about being wrong. This is the only thing it could be. Very briefly, here are the other choices for how the binary submodels could be created. So regardless of whether you have ordinal data, nominal data, or you're not sure if it's ordered, all of those would use a multinomial distribution for the outcome. How the binary submodels get created then dictates whether or not these things are enforced in order. So what is known as a partial credit model in IRT 
It is otherwise known as an adjacent category link function, and it works like this. Because I have four categories, I will always have three submodels. But this one doesn't lump things together. It just tells me directly, given that you answered zero or one, so conditioning on just that, those two possibilities, what's the probability that you answered one instead of zero? The next one then, conditioning on just one and two, what's the probability that it's two instead of one? And so on. I personally like this one a lot better. I find it's easier to explain and it's more intuitive, but it is very rarely used in the world of regression and used more often, I think, in IRT. One of the problems why it's not used as much is because if you don't have a lot of data in these categories, the model becomes really unstable. So like if you only have three people who answered three, like this last set here is going to be very difficult to ask, estimate. The last one then, for nominal, again, four responses, three submodels. This one is like dummy coding your outcome. So you take one response category and you say, this is my reference. And then each of the submodels tells you the probability of answering something else relative to the reference. So in this case, I put three as my reference because that's what happens in M plus by default. And it would tell me, given that someone answered a three or a zero, what's the probability they answered zero instead of three? Given that they answered three or one, what's the probability of a one instead of three? And so on. So different ways of carving up a categorical outcome into binary submodels yields different conclusions about what the model is predicting, but that's it. That's the only difference. Everything else is exactly what you already learned. You believe me? No. Either you don't believe me or it's 2.51 in the afternoon and we're running, we're running low. Is it that one? Yeah, that's fair, right? Cheers. But now you understand why I'm double fisted today. All right. So terminology then, adding, translating these same ideas into what they're called in IRT. Polytomous is categorical. Unlike the binary models, they are not named with numbers. So for binary models, we talk about a 1PL or a 2PL or a 3PL or a 4PL. These ones are different names based on the person who originally came up with it, and the names are sometimes confusing and overlapping. I'm sorry. That's, that's just how it is. Like, I'm just the messenger here. But what I would call a cumulative model or a proportional odds model is going to be called a graded response model or a modified version of it that has constraints to it. Notably, graded response as a form has separate discriminations across items. So it's analogous to a 2PL just for categorical responses instead of binary. The partially ordered is partial credit is adjacent category. The original version of partial credit is a, is a Roche model. It does not have different item uh, discriminations across items. The generalized version of it does. And then nominal is just called that, and that's the baseline one where it's like dummy coding your outcome. So extending the idea of pretend underlying variables that you secretly have under your categorical data that we had from binary, same idea with respect to this too. So each submodel is going to have a threshold and then a prediction from a trait. And if we're talking about predicting the original underlying variable as my Y star, then it has an E on it. Otherwise, uh, we don't have an E anymore either because there's no error variance estimated in these models. And the same difference in scale between probits and logits holds as well. So if you're willing to say that your pretend continuous underlying variable is normally distributed, that is consistent with the probit link function, otherwise known as what in IRT? Starts with an O. Ojive, yeah. So probit and ojive versus our friend logit, which is consistent with the underlying variable being logistically distributed, which has a variance of 3.29, or pi squared over 3 instead. So the logit probit thing is exactly as it was before. 
You can choose which one you want if you're using full information maximum likelihood. You're stuck with probits if you're using limited information WLSMV. So then graded response. That's the one that we're going to focus in class on. I have examples of other things, but we're not going to have a chance to talk about all of them. This is the idea of 0 versus 1, 2, 3, 0, 1 versus 2, 3, 0, 1, 2 versus 3. And so now the dollar sign thing makes a little bit more sense. The first submodel for this item in M plus will be labeled as dollar sign 1 for its threshold. The second one will be dollar sign 2. And the third one will be dollar sign 3. So now you will have as many thresholds as you have response categories minus 1. Unfortunately, M plus does not spit out the corresponding A's and B's by default. But I wrote some code to do it relatively quickly using model constraint, and I will show that to you as one of the examples. Here, hang on, come back. The, uh, there's certain slides where the words always move over, and I always save it and move it back, but then it doesn't hold, and I have yet to figure out why. But this is one of them. It always does that. So here's what the combined model would look like if I were fitting an ordinal response format with four categories and I'm using a graded response model to do it. Here are the two different parameterizations. The IRT version that has A's and B's defined exactly as you had before versus the IFA version that has thresholds and loadings instead. So the first submodel predicts zero versus something higher than zero. So the way that I've written that inside the y part of the equation here is y greater than zero. That's what it's being predicted, is anything greater than zero. The second submodel is y greater than one, and then the third is y greater than two. So I can write that in IRT form as a times theta minus b, and I want to point out the notation here. Theta has an S, because theta is an item thing or a person thing? Person thing, okay. So that means A and B are item things. Now A has the same I across all three submodels. That means it's shared. It's an A across all of them. This model assumes that the slope relating theta to the response doesn't care which response you're actually predicting. When you say it that way, it sounds crazy. But that's what, that's what this model says. That's the graded response model, and this is by far the most common way to model ordinal data. So A sub I means that each item gets a different A as usual. So item 1 has a different A than item 2 has a different A than item 3. So items can be unequally discriminating in this model. But within an item, the submodels for that item that divide the ordinal responses into a series of binaries, they share the A. Does that make sense? Maybe? Even at 2.58 in the afternoon, it makes sense? Now, they don't share the B. So there's numbers after the B's here because each submodel gets a different B. So difficulty, in this case, translates into one difficulty per submodel, but the definition of it is exactly the same. What was difficulty in a binary model? You remember? Like the definition of it? Location. Yep, it's the location on theta where the probability of a one response is is 0.5, right? That is what it means here too. The only catch is that you need to use air quotes to say what a one is. In the first submodel, the one is an answer greater than zero. In the second submodel, the one is an answer of two or three. And in the third submodel, it's an answer of three as the one. But the definition is the same. It's the point on theta where the probability of the next category, whatever it is, is 50-50. If we wanted to get other ones, we would just subtract. 
you so you can get the probability of any of the middle ones, but it would be you can't just subtract the B's to do it. You'd have to compute the probability and then subtract the probabilities. Okay. Yeah, it's an order of operations yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, here's what a picture would look like. So this is one item that has four categories and I have three different curves on here. They are called category response curves at this point. They could still be item characteristic curves and I think that's actually what the menu says in M plus. So the pink line would be the first submodel. So this minus two here is the point on theta where you have a 50-50 probability of moving from zero to something greater than zero. The yellow line is at a theta of zero is the difficulty, is where you transition from zero one to two three. And the aqua, can we go do this? Cyan, I think. Cyan, can we take a vote? Yeah. Teal? No. No. Wow, there's some really strong funny. opinions about cyan. Okay, cyan. What about the graphic artists? Fair, fair. <laughs> so, so this is like where, um, like in The Devil Wears Prada, like she's talking about cerulean. You know, it's not just blue. Like, I defer. Cyan. It is. Cyan is positive 2. So it takes a theta of positive 2 to move past 0, 1, 2 into 3 with 50-50 probability. And these curves are all parallel. Coincidence or consequence? consequence? Consequence, yeah. Because the A is the same. Proportional so can I, odds. Can yep. I ask, following up on the question that I asked previously, yes. so if we had a theta of 2, let's say, and we wanted to get the probability of a 2, we would essentially take the yellow line of about 0.9 mm -hmm. and subtract 0.5 because that's where psi am. Yep, yes. exactly. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, the difference between the curves is how you would get to the predicted probability. But I can't answer any more questions like that because I have to leave now. So our, our visitor in the back here who's been very quietly uh, observing us would like to speak with you about your experience in this class and with me as your instructor. So what I'm going to do is first off stop the recording.